Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give everyone a, another few seconds to get in the room and then we'll get started. All right, it's noon and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jana Rudler. I'm the Grants and Technical Services Manager at the Preservation League of New York State. Today we'll be learning all about Preserve New York grants. Uh, these grants um, come around once a year and the cycle is now open. And uh, so we'll talk about eligibility requirements, uh, what kinds of projects we fund through Preserve New York uh, how to apply, and then I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A tab. You can click on that and type your question in at any time, and I'll take a couple of breaks uh, during my presentation to answer questions as they roll in, and then we'll take some time at the end as well uh, to answer any questions you have. So uh, our Preserve New York uh, grant program is a partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts with additional funding from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation. Uh, we're very grateful for this partnership with NISCA and with Gardner, and uh, we thank them for their support of our Preserve New York grant program. A little bit about the Preservation League, if you're not familiar with us, uh, the Preservation League of New York State is a nonprofit organization. We are the statewide nonprofit working for historic preservation in New York. Uh, we work across all 62 counties. We're headquartered in Albany, although a lot of our staff are working remotely at this time from Rochester and myself from the Southern Tier near Binghamton. So uh, we are poised to serve the entire state with technical services uh, in grants and other programs. In fact, we have a slew of programs ready to assist you with historic preservation at any time. So we work with our local colleagues uh, across the state, and these are your local preservation organizations you might be familiar with, uh, Preserve Buffalo Niagara, Preservation Long Island, Preserve uh, uh, Preservation <laughs> Association of Central New York, Pacney, Past, um, Arch up in the Adirondacks. We work with all of them to make sure that uh, local communities are empowered with the best tools possible to uh, uh, do good historic preservation work in their regions. Um, we also work in public policy at both the state and federal level to make sure that historic preservation always has a seat at the table when it comes to um, bills and laws that affect uh, community development and revitalization. We provide technical services all across the state through uh, these days through Zoom programs, and uh, we have guest speakers come in. We talk about um, preservation best practices. We also come to your communities wherever possible to help out as well. Um, our Seven to Save program just kicked off uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're accepting nominations for that. Our Seven to Save list uh, is um, every two years. Um, we accept nominations for endangered properties. And uh, with this comes enhanced technical assistance from the Preservation League to try to save these endangered properties. So if you know of one uh, that could be on our seven to save list, you can contact us at any time or fill out the nomination form on our website. We also give grants and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, two grant cycles a year, technical assistance grants and preserve New York grants. Uh, these are for preservation planning projects. We give excellence awards every year for uh, historic preservation projects, individuals working in preservation, uh, anything that is uh, noteworthy in preservation across the state. Um, we have our preservation book club and uh, we've got some dates coming up for that on Thursdays we meet to talk about uh, um, books that deal in some way with preservation. They're really interesting and fun to attend. You can check that out on our website as well. And finally, we give scholarships to historic preservation students through our Zabar Scholarship Fund. 
So we're here to talk about grants today. Uh, we'll uh, just talk briefly about technical assistance grants. They roll around in the fall um, with usually an October deadline um, and preserve New York grants in the springtime, which just opened with a uh, deadline of April 15th. So technical assistance grants, just like our Preserve New York grants, are a partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts with support from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation for projects occurring on Long Island. And uh, our TAG grants also enjoy support from the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area for projects occurring in that area. Our grants are open to 501c3 nonprofits and municipalities. The applicant needs to own the building or have a long-term lease. By that, we mean at least a six-year lease on the building and at least six years have to be remaining in that lease at the time of application. If you are a leasee of a historic building, the owner of that building needs to be a 501c3 nonprofit or municipality. So this is a non-negotiable part of our eligibility requirements that the owner of the building needs to be a 501c3 nonprofit or a municipality. Um, for technical assistance grants only, uh, the building needs to have an arts or cultural purpose. We look for arts and cultural programming that occur in the building. Um, this is not a, a requirement of Preserve New York grants, so we'll talk a little bit about that later. But if you are uh, stewarding an arts or cultural uh, organization in your building, then this is uh, a grant that's open to you. Our TAG grants top out at $4,000 for a $5,000 project. What that means is that uh, you're required to come up with a 20% cash match. If your project costs $5,000, um, we will grant up to $4,000 for that project, and you will have to come up with $1,000 as your cash match. So the project types that we fund through our technical assistance grants are a building condition survey. And this is a look at specific issues affecting your building, um, engineering structural analysis, feasibility reuse studies, specialized conservation studies, handicap accessibility studies, and mechanical, electrical, and plumbing analyses. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, these uh, project types in more detail later in the summertime when it comes time for technical assistance grants. But um, as uh, a form of example, on your screen, you see the Science Museum of Long Island's Norwood House. Uh, in 2020, they received a TAG grant for $4,000 for a building condition survey of their windows. So this kind of building condition assessment looks at one specific uh, element of the building that needs attention. In this case, it was their windows. They have many and varied windows in varying state of repair or disrepair. So um, this TAG grant went to pay for a survey of their windows, looking at the condition and offering uh, specific recommendations for repair and maintenance for each of the windows. Now in 2021, uh, the Science Museum of Long Island came back for a TAG grant again, for, this time for an accessibility study. So they're trying to make sure that the interior of the building is ac as accessible as possible to their visitors. And as we all know, when you're dealing with an old building, it can be difficult to get people with mobility issues inside and up to those upper floors. So that's what their accessibility study will be looking at for them. We gave out technical assistance grants to the tune of almost $63,000 last year, all across the state. Uh, from Long Island to Buffalo and everywhere in between. Uh, we funded various project types from accessibility studies, uh, building condition surveys, structural analyses, feasibility reuse studies, and one specialized conservation study. Now I did wanna point out that the specialized conservation study refers to the conservation of a building material or some specific aspect of your building that requires a specialized uh, form of analysis. So um, don't let that term conservation fool you. Uh, this is dealing entirely with buildings and not with archives or collections. So it's not referring to those kinds of grants. Um, so five of those projects fell in the Hudson River Valley and three uh, were eligible for Gardner funds on Long Island. So those additional funds make our grants go just a little bit farther. 
So today we're here to talk about Preserve New York grants above, um, above all things. So uh, this is a partnership, as I mentioned, with NISCA, uh, with support from the Gardner Foundation. Preserve New York grants are open to 501c3 nonprofits and municipalities that own their building or have a long-term lease. Um, Preserve New York funds four specific project types, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. They're building condition reports, historic structure reports, cultural landscape reports, and cultural resource surveys. And we'll talk about each one of those in detail in a moment. Uh, our grant awards don't really have an upper ceiling, although, um, they tend to top out at about $20,000. Most of the grant awards for PNY fall between five and $14,000. Um, you are required to come up with a 20% cash match of the project budget. So if your project costs $20,000, then you would need to come up with a 20% uh, cash match for that, and then we would fund the rest. In 2021, uh, we presented uh, Preserve New York grants all across the state once again with a good distribution uh, all the way from the upper Adirondacks all the way to city of Jamestown, the tip of Long Island and Buffalo and everywhere in between, funding all four project types. So if you're thinking about uh, applying for a Preserve New York grant, there are a few things to keep in mind. So our Preserve New York grants are intended to proceed uh, fairly major capital projects. Um, the difference between uh, technical assistance grants and Preserve New York grants is the scope uh, of the project more than anything. Technical assistance grants are meant to help you with specific issues that your building is facing. Um, they're fairly simple uh, projects that result in fairly simple um, or at least a single prong remediation. Whereas uh, Preserve New York grants proceed large capital projects that encompass the entire building for the most part. So uh, when you're considering applying for Preserve New York, you want to think about the entire uh, scope of a capital project. And I've got some steps listed here on the screen that you might think about with regard to your project. Preserve New York grants fall in those two first two steps of condition assessment and preservation planning study. So uh, a Preserve New York grant funds a, a report to take a look, an overall look at your building and uh, assess its existing condition and make recommendations for repair and remediation going forward. So you wanna make sure that your organization is prepared to tackle the entire process. You know, We would hate to see you get a Preserve New York grant, have that study sit on a shelf and never go anywhere. So we want to see that you're prepared uh, to undertake a fairly major capital project um, after your report comes in. So uh, the picture on the screen uh, is the uh, Sattler Theater. Uh, this historic theater is located um, in Buffalo and Erie County. And the Western New York Minority Media Professionals received a $10,000 PNY grant uh, to undertake a building condition report of this building. And they have been of fundraising for years and working on rehabilitating this historic theater in Buffalo. So we're happy to be, to be part of that project. So just a few more notes on capital project planning. Um, think about how the project, the proposed project helps you meet your mission. So it's important to be able to articulate how your building and rehabilitation of your building helps your organization meet, meet its mission. This is a good exercise to undertake, uh, not just uh, for your Preserve New York grant application, but moving forward to other grant applications you might do in the future uh, to fund future work. So just being able to articulate that is important. You'll need that for your summary letter and, and for uh, talking with potential funders about your project. And also make sure that your entire organization is on board with this project. We wanna see that your board is truly on board uh, and prepared to tackle the task of fundraising uh, for your capital campaign because grants alone aren't going to cover uh, the cost of any project. There was an important part, um, but uh, you need to consider the entire fundraising puzzle before you uh, commit to a project of this scope. And finally, you'll want to hire qualified building can, uh, professionals. And luckily, um, the consultant that you get um, to 
to produce your building planning uh, project through Preserve New York, we'll be able to connect you more than likely with uh, qualified building professionals to do the work uh, in the future. So this is um, just one of the benefits of getting a Preserve New York grant and connecting with um, a preservation consultant. They usually have uh, connections within the field and can connect you with the, with the right people. All right, so I mentioned that uh, Preserve New York grants fund four different types of projects, historic structure reports, building condition reports, cultural landscape reports, and cultural resource surveys. So let's take a look at each one now. Um, a historic structure report is a comprehensive condition analysis of the structure, plus research about the building's architectural history. So um, this is a comprehensive look at your building, inside and outside, top to bottom and um, a report on its existing conditions. But it has the additional um, benefit of background historical research on your building. So if your building has undergone changes over time, if there have been uh, periods of construction, maybe there was a wing built on at one time, maybe the building has been used for different uses over time. Um, the historic research would uncover those things and help you interpret the building more fully to the public. And that brings us to the second point here is that a historic structure report is particularly useful for buildings that are being interpreted to the public. Um, not just historic house museums, but other uh, buildings as well where their history uh, is important to, to your visitors. And you wanna make sure that you're interpreting that and telling as full a story as you possibly can about your building. Um, we'll have, uh, an example coming up about a historic structure report and what that might look like. So these are usually completed by an architect or some other building consultant um, with uh, architectural history experience. A building condition report is a lot like a historic structure report just without that historic research background. So uh, this is for a building um, that just needs a comprehensive uh, conditions analysis. Um, from the roof to the foundation, inside and out, it gives you an idea of your building's condition, what its needs are, and uh, can produce a plan for you moving forward for its um, maintenance and rehabilitation. These uh, A building condition report can be structured uh, to and tailored to meet uh, the organization's needs. So if there are certain aspects of the building, certain building materials that need attention, uh, your consultant can focus on those for you and make uh, more specific uh, recommendations. Now, a cultural landscape report is similar to a historic structure report, except that it's uh, specific to the landscape uh, rather than the building itself. Um, this will include a conditions analysis as well as a description of the historic significance of the landscape. This requires quite a bit of uh, historical research and is usually completed by a landscape architect. We have funded cultural landscape reports for historic house museums that wanted to go ahead and um, more fully interpret their uh, gardens and grounds. Um, we've funded cultural landscape reports for cemeteries. So uh, there are all sorts of uh, applications for this. And finally, the cultural resource survey, that's, that's a little bit different than the other three categories. Um, this is an inventory of the historic resources in an area or a municipality um, in order to determine the historic significance, settlement patterns, industrial development of an area. And this usually is uh, intended to lay the groundwork for the creation of a historic district. So we get a lot of applications for um, cultural resource surveys. Uh, in preparation for a National Register Historic District nomination. Now, a few words about cultural resource surveys. There are different levels. A uh, re reconnaissance survey just gets an overall idea of the kinds of buildings in the area, um, building uh, construction dates, architectural styles. It's an overall look at the historic resources in an area. A more intensive level survey would uh, undertake uh, historic research of specific buildings, um, notable buildings in the community, buildings that are particularly noteworthy. Um, and uh, finally, a state and national register nomination of a district, that's the most intensive level, uh, requires quite a bit of uh, research and work, and we fund those through PNY. 
Um, any of these surveys can also lead to a lo local district local district nomination, although we don't see that quite as often. So a couple words about national and state registers. Um, so uh, there are two kinds of districts uh, that you might find in a community. There are local historic districts and national register districts. And it's important to understand the difference between the two. Uh, we do entire webinars on the difference between the two, but just for our uh, purposes today, uh, it's important to understand that the National Register Historic District is not equal to local landmarking uh, in terms of regulation. So most regulations that you'll find on uh, properties within a district come from the local level. Um, National Register is uh, intended to protect properties from acts of government and not from their owners. So um, when, when you find a National Register listed building or district, uh, that building would be protected from uh, state and federal initiatives that might affect the building. So for instance, if there's a road widening take, taking place um, that's initiated at the state and federal level, if it is going to impact any National Register listed properties, um, they would be required to undergo a, an additional level of, um, of regulation. Uh, and this just protects those properties from being uh, adversely impacted by that road widening. Um, National Register historic uh, listing is mostly honorific, but it does open the door to incentives for property owners, most notably in the form of historic tax credits. So that's usually the goal. Uh, when a community wants to uh, get a district listed on the National Register of Historic Places, they're trying to make sure that property owners can access historic tax credits uh, to help them maintain and improve their properties. So as I mentioned, historic tax credits are a big perk of being listed on the National and State Registers of Historic Places. Um, currently, uh, people are uh, eligible for a 20% federal rehabilitation tax credit on income producing properties located within National Register Historic Districts or up to a 25% rehabilitation tax credit um, if, uh, if it's a small project uh, and small being under $5 million. So most projects would fall into that, uh, giving uh, quite a significant tax credit for income producing properties. Now, uh, the historic Homeowner tax credit is 20% currently. That is a state uh, tax credit program. And uh, some national register listed properties are also eligible for grants as well. So the national register um, program is uh, overseen by uh, the New York State Parks uh, Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation as well as the National Park Service. Um, for more information, uh, you can check out their website. And something that I failed to mention earlier is that the slides in this presentation will be made available to you afterwards. So don't worry about writing down all these links. Uh, you will have them sent to you. Now, the Preservation League has also done, as I mentioned, entire webinars about historic tax credits and National Register listings. And you can check those out on our YouTube channel at any time. All right, so as promised, uh, let's take a look at a couple of specific uh, Preserve New York funded projects. Um, and today we're going to look at them along with uh, what came next for those projects. So one of the questions I get most often is, okay, I get a Preserve New York grant and I get this preservation planning project underway. And then I have uh, this report that makes recommendations for uh, maintenance and rehabilitation work on the building. So how do I fund that? Well, one way to fund future work on your building is through the Regional Economic Development Council's grants, um, or notoriously known as the CFA, the Consolidated Funding Application. And before you roll your eyes and groan about this, um, just realize that this is a very real source of funds uh, that New York State makes available uh, for economic revitalization and uh, community development. And uh, several of the projects that we have funded in the past through Preserve New York and, and through TAG have received our EDC grants. And in 2021, uh, 15 of the 488 
projects that received grants had direct ties with uh, league support previously. So we're gonna take a look at three of those today. Uh, I find them really inspiring and I hope you do too. So the Albany County Historical Association operates the uh, circus 1798 Tenbrook Mansion and over four acres of historic gardens as an educational museum in the heart of Albany. In 2015, uh, they applied for a technical assistance grant of $2,780 for a building condition survey. So this survey was intended uh, to inform their interpretation of some of the hidden spaces in their mansion, spaces that had been occupied by enslaved and immigrant laborers. Um, and uh, you know they wanted to better interpret those spaces. And they also needed information uh, to provide um, guidance for possible future major renovation projects at the mansion. So uh, this was a fairly large scope for a building condition survey, to be honest, but uh, this is a project that uh, that had been begun previously pro bono by their consultant and just needed to be finished up. So we uh, funded that to the tune of uh, $2,780 in 2015. So they used that, that information and then came back in 2018 for a more comprehensive historic structure report. So as I mentioned earlier, a historic structure report is an overall look at the building, very comprehensive, top to bottom, inside and out. Um, they needed this uh, to lay out uh, a little bit more detail for future work of the building. And because it was a historic structure report, it included quite a bit of historic background. And that is consistent with the intention behind their building condition survey in 2015. They wanted to better interpret the spaces within the mansion. So they needed some historic research to back that up. So uh, a 2020 uh, Preserve New York grant um, of $10,000. Uh, nope, that's their cultural resource. Okay, a 2018 grant uh, paid for that historic structure report. Now, part of that report, um, when it was finished, identified the historic landscape as a key area that required additional study documentation and a preservation plan. So in response to the recommendations made to them in their historic structure report in 2018, they came back to us in 2020 for a Preserve New York grant for a cultural landscape report. So uh, this cultural landscape report, um, it indicated uh, landscape development going back uh, to as early as 1764 on the property. And following the recommendations by the historic structure report, as well as archeology span that had been undertaken by the New York State Museum on site, uh, they were looking for um, phases in this uh, landscape development. The landscape had been intentionally designed with complex plantings, including imported flowers, um, the mansion and landscape are a rare example of a formal 18th century estate in the upper Hudson Valley. So the cultural landscape report delved a little deeper into that landscape and its development. Um, a few reasons uh, apart from learning more about the landscape's development uh, was that the landscape was uh, fast becoming one of the most endangered aspects of this historic property. Um, Erosion and water damage were actually endangering the building itself, and uh, pathways were unsafe and unclear for visitors. Um, the Albany Fire Department had actually contacted them and said, if there's ever a fire, God forbid, in the mansion, it might be difficult to access uh, for firefighting. So that was a really compelling reason uh, to get um, a better layout design for their site. Um, and finally, their parking area was uh, damaging the landscape and requires some professional design. So their cultural landscape report was able to make recommendations for all of this. Now these three grants that I've mentioned laid the groundwork for their uh, 2021 uh, REDC grant application. At about the same time that they were applying uh, through the CFA for their REDC grant, um, the Albany County Historical Association uh, came back to us again, this time for a technical assistance grant for a feasibility reuse study. Now, this is where things get really interesting. So um, 
the feasibility reuse study was for the Tenbrook Olcott Carriage Barn. Um, this is an integral feature of the cultural landscape. Uh, their historic structure report and their cultural landscape report both identified the carriage barn as critical to the period of significance for the Tenbrook Mansion. So critical for the interpretation of their history. And, um, but unfortunately, due to a lack of funding for stabilization work uh, in the 1970s through the 1990s, the carriage barn itself had deteriorated to such a degree that uh, it was torn down by order of the city of Albany in 1999. So a feasibility reuse study for a building that no longer exists. Well, um, this re reuse study was actually to see if it would be possible to rebuild upon the old foundation. So the Albany County Historical Association uh, already has historic surveys and maps historic drawings and photographs of the carriage barn in its collections, as well as architectural salvage from the structure. Um, the remains that, that are still in the ground, the Institute remains, um, include portions of the foundation, uh, shapes uh, sandstone blocks uh, with water troughs and granite thresholds. So extensive archeological ex excavations on the site have located the remaining buried portions of the foundation. So uh, the subject of their tag study is to see if those foundation remains can be used um, for rebuilding uh, the carriage barn on their site. Um, they're looking to rebuild this barn, not just for historic uh, uh, interpretation purposes, but they have dire need of a uh, visitor center on the site. Um, this uh, proposed visitor center would, uh, would contain ADA uh, compliant restrooms, it would be fully accessible, and it would be, a way to greet visitors uh, directly between the parking lot and the mansion itself to provide a safe and accessible path between the parking lot and the mansion. So um, this feasibility and reuse study will allow them to begin implementing the cultural landscape report and, um, and to be able to build this visitor center. So the REDC grant that they received in 2021 was on all of these. And uh, that $283,350 grant will go toward the mansion stabilization and accessibility project. So um, it's, this is the best example that I could find of how one grant uh, can build on another and build a case uh, for a very significant capital grant down the road. So they've done a wonderful job of planning. And I think that um, that's one of the things to keep in mind. And planning is so important to know how all these pieces are going to fit together um, and to be able to leverage a, a larger grant with these smaller grants from the Preservation League. So this is a wonderful example um, of how that can, can work out. So the second example I have is the um, Oneida Community Mansion House. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a National Historic Landscape. Um, it's a museum, it's lodging and cultural uh, and uh, event venue um, in need of restoration. So in 2016, uh, the Oneida Community Mansion House came to the Preservation League for a building condition report. So they received a PNY grant of $8,000 to identify and prioritize the building's most severe deficiencies, both interior and exterior and to provide recommendations for repairs. And that right there is about the most straightforward um, description of a building condition report that I can think of. So identifying and prioritizing the building's most severe deficiencies and making recommendations for repairs. Excellent. So they got that in 2016. Um, and I might, I, I wanted to mention too that that uh, builds on previous uh, condition surveys they had had in 1990. They had um, an existing conditions survey done. And then in 2002, a historic structure report. So the historic structure report would have provided them an overall look at the building. But 14 years later, the building had some, uh, some changes, you know, as happens over time with old buildings. And it was time to update that with a building condition report. They didn't need another historic structure report because um, the historic research had been done, although. We always argue that research is never really done, but uh, they had gotten enough research out of that uh, HSR in 2002 that they really just needed 
an updated uh, building condition report. So they took that report and they used it as the basis for applying for an REDC grant in uh, 2021. And they received half a million dollars to complete phase two of their exterior restoration project. Now this work is part of a multi-year preservation initiative by the Oneida Community Mansion House. Um, over the next 10 years, they foresee spending uh, as much as $6.5 million on critical repairs to the roof, facade, foundation, and more. So this is just a couple of pieces of their uh, funding puzzle for work on the mansion, but I would say pretty significant that they were able to get a half a million dollar grant. Um, and that building condition report, no doubt, uh, provided some important information and planning uh, before. All right, so the last example I have for you today is a cultural resource survey from Philmont Beautification uh, in uh, Columbia County. So Philmont Beautification Incorporated has been working uh, with the State Historic Preservation Office since 2006 to provide property owners with information and resources to encourage historic preservation activities within their village. They have made uh, historic preservation a village-wide priority and they've taken some very intentional steps to ensure the preservation of their historic buildings. So um, within the scope of their Main Street and housing programs, uh, Philmont Beautification or PBI has successfully provided resources to property owners that have led to the rehabilitation of 21 buildings uh, in Philmont and encouraging the use of the historic tax credit programs that I mentioned earlier and supporting a guest lecture series on preservation practices as well as spearheading a zoning revisions project to include design standards to enhance historic preservation in the village. So like I said, a lot of very intentional steps that they've been taking within their village to ensure the preservation of their buildings. One part of that was their cultural resource survey in 2019 made possible through Preserve New York. So they completed this survey and uh, in 2021, I think, um, but when they completed their survey, uh, they continued their public outreach by having a public presentation of the survey's findings. And that brings me to an important point. So um, throughout the entire uh, survey process, Philmont Beautification was committed to robust community engagement. Um, this included uh, a historic resources exhibition on Main Street in the storefronts that was tied to their local library's local history collection. And they had guest speaker events as well. So I can't stress enough the importance of um, community engagement when it comes to cultural resource surveys. So before, during, and after the survey, you want to make sure that you're engaging um, successfully with your uh, with the public and be sure that people understand what's happening with your surveys. So um, their consultant was particularly good at this. Uh, she was able to come in and give a thorough presentation after the uh, after the survey had wrapped up and they kept in contact with uh, their village residents during the fact too. So um, this is an extremely important part of any cultural resource survey. If you're planning to apply for a Preserve New York grant for a cultural resource survey, please include uh, your plans for community engagement in your summary letter. Make sure that we understand what you plan to do to engage the public. So it's extremely important. You wanna make sure that people are on board with this project and that they thoroughly understand uh, what this project means to them as property owners. I can't stress that enough. All right, so are there any questions about the three examples I gave today? of Preserve New York grants that led to uh, much larger grants later. Um, actually, I didn't finish talking about Philmont Beautification. Um, their grant led to a $20,000 REDC grant in 2021 for a feasibility analysis and reuse study uh, for properties in the villages downtown. And that's another great idea that Philmont Beautification had. Um, and that's uh, when you are revitalizing properties in a village. You wanna make sure that there's a plan for those properties, right? You don't just want a bunch of pretty buildings on your main street if they're gonna be vacant. Uh, you wanna have a good plan for how to utilize those buildings when all is said and done. So they are taking a very uh, 
intentional uh, approach by uh, getting this grant uh, to fund a feasibility analysis and reuse study for the buildings in the village. I think that's a wonderful idea and it's part of their overall plan. Um, I think that this is one village to watch uh, over the, the coming years and see how things turn out for them. So I do have one question that has come in. So uh, Sarah asks, uh, can a Preserve New York grant for a building condition report be used to, ask, to assess the structure's preservation needs and provide recommendations for adaptive reuse of a historic barn or contributing resource to be rehabilitated as a program space and visitor services building? That's a really good question. So um, as you probably noticed through technical assistance grants, we fund um, feasibility and reuse studies. Um, but a building condition report absolutely can contain that element as well, and they often do. So as you probably noticed um, earlier when we were talking about uh, the Tenbrook Mansion and their intentions to um, uh, interpret spaces within the mansion, that was part of a building condition survey. So sometimes uh, things like that, interpretation, uh, of the historic resource are included in these reports. It may not seem obvious at first, but it can certainly be part of a report. Um, and uh, yes, adaptive reuse issues can certainly come into a building condition report as well. So that's a great question and the answer is yes. So thank you, Sarah, for answering or for asking that question. So um, I have a couple other questions that came in. Uh, in 2021, 31 grants were awarded. How many proposals were submitted in total? That's a really great question. And um, so out of the 31 grants that we awarded for PNY in 2021, I think we received 63 applications. So we, we granted roughly 50% of them. And I'm glad you asked that, Kate, because it's important to remember that Preserve New York grants are pretty competitive. Um, uh, funding 50% of them is, a, is pretty decent odds, but uh, please keep in mind that these are competitive grants. There's no guarantee that you'll be funded. Um, but uh, we'll talk in a, in a moment about the way that the grants are evaluated and how you can increase your chances of scoring a little higher uh, for your applications. So thank you for that question. Also, a uh, question from Deborah. My building is a community center that we would like on the state historic register. It was a one room schoolhouse. Is there anything that applies? Hmm. Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, as long as you're a qualified applicant, you can certainly uh, apply for a historic structure report, which, um, may not make sense at first, but a historic structure report contains that historic background research that you would need in order to write a state and national register nomination for your building. So, um, you know, typically our cultural resource surveys uh, are for uh, multiple property um, nominations, but a nomination for an individual building would require that research. Oh, and you already have the research done. So, um, that's a question I'll have to get back to you on, Deborah. to be honest, because uh, funding for a consultant to help you with your national register process may be possible, but I'm not 100% sure. So um, I will reach back out to you uh, with a better answer to that question. All right, thank you. All right. Let's see, for a cultural resource survey application, what aspects of the project will the grant fund? That it, does it only cover the cost of the consultant? Good question, Sarah, and yes, you're right. Um, so our grants do cover consultant costs, and that's it. We don't cover overhead for the um, applying organization. Uh, we only cover the consultant's fees. Um, the consultant will uh, provide you with a scope of work. Uh, so we fund uh, within that scope of work. Um, and this is typically just the, uh, the survey itself and their expenses uh, relating to doing that survey. So good question, Sarah. And uh, another question, one from Candace, do you, need to subject, uh, do you need to submit a full report, study, or analysis before receiving the grant? Um, what kind of reporting requirements are there? Good question. So um, the reporting requirements uh, is the submission of the report afterwards. So uh, you, re you receive the money up front. Uh, if you get a Preserve New York grant, uh, we have you sign the, um, the grant um, contract. 
and the consultant agreement. You get those back to us. We send you the check and then uh, you commence the work. When the work is finished, you submit the full report to us and that closes out your grant. So thank you for asking, that's a good question. And finally, is it possible to meet with you prior to submitting a proposal to discuss which of the project types uh, fit best? Yes, absolutely. And that's something I, uh, I wanna point out as well is that it's, it's always good to communicate with me um, when you're thinking about applying, uh, if you're not sure which uh, project type fits, fits your needs the best, uh, we can figure that out through a conversation or two. So um, yes, absolutely. It's, it's a good idea to reach out for those conversations with the league. All right. So um, if you're interested in reading uh, more about the REDC grants and how um, our grants led to those successful applications. You can read about them on our website. We have a blog post up about it. Um, and uh, like I said, there were 15 uh, grantees that we uh, identified that had enjoyed previous grant support from the league. All right, so let me make sure that I have answered all these questions before we move on. Oh, there's one more. Okay, could my local partner Arch help my group determine whether the building um, process of acquiring would apply for. Um, okay, so let me see if I understand your question properly, Susan. So uh, could your local preservation partner help you determine whether the building uh, your non for profit is in the process of acquiring would qualify for? Oh, um, and they might know, but you can ask us too. Um, and uh, the eligibility requirements for applying for a Preserve New York grant um, is simply that uh, that the building is owned by a nonprofit or municipality. So if your not-for-profit is a 501c3, that makes you eligible right there. Um, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of other eligibility requirements to consider. So if you're acquiring a historic property, most likely you would. You know, you can feel free to give us a call. Um, Ownership is a requirement though of applying. So, um, you know, as you are going through this process, uh, you know, keep in touch with us. Um, if you're looking to apply, we wanna make sure that your ownership um, is uh, solidified before, before uh, you apply. And uh, who would be the best person to contact? That would be me. So, and my contact information will be at the end of this, um, in the, at the end of this presentation. Um, let's see. So we've got a couple other questions. Let me grab those. Um, oh, the shout out to PBI, indeed, uh, doing such awesome work there. Um, we'll post a record. Oh, great. Hi, Sally. Okay, so Sally from P PBI is tuning in today to hear all our glowing things about them. And uh, they'll be posting a recording on their website um, about their cultural resource survey and the work that they're doing. So that's really cool. Um, uh, making it accessible to the public as you are. So thank you very much, Sally, for that. Um, wonderful. And are churches el 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 eligible for these grants? Suzanne, I'm sorry, but they're not. So our grants are not open to religious organizations. There are other options out there for you, though, um, and I would be happy to uh, let you know what those are. So, um, but no, unfortunately, our grants are not. Being a partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts, we are um, bound to the certain kinds of organizations we can fund through their rules. Um, Deborah, how do I reach you? I missed the first five minutes. That's okay, Deborah. My contact information will be at the end. So um, uh, let me just uh, uh, move forward a few slides so we can get to um, some of these other questions. Okay, so when it's time to apply, um, our application is fairly uh, straightforward. Um, we recommend that the first thing you do is re read the grant guidelines. They're available on our website. And I also make those available to everyone who submits a pre-application and that's step number two here. So the pre-application is on our website as well. It's a really simple form that you fill out that allows us to determine uh, the eligibility of your organization to apply, the eligibility of your building to receive the grant. Um, and if everything checks out, then I send you uh, the link to the full application, I send you the grant guidelines and a consultant list. So if you're not sure who to turn to as a consultant, don't worry, we do have a list of consultants that have 
um, successfully completed our grant funded projects in the past. You don't have to choose someone from our consultant list, but um, it's there for your convenience in case you do need that help. Um, uh, once you have uh, completed these three steps, go out and start taking photos of your building or your project area if it's a cultural resource survey. Um, we do require 10 photographs with the application. And uh, so you wanna show at least one overall view of the building and then start to narrow in uh, showing details of the areas of concern. If this is a cultural resource survey, make sure you take plenty of streetscape pictures. Um, you can take pictures of individual buildings that are particularly noteworthy in your project area as well. Um, be sure and preview the application. So once I send you uh, the application link, uh, you'll be able to preview the application and I have a screenshot coming up of how that will look uh, for you. Um, of course, follow the application instructions. They're easy, they pop up on the application itself. So as you're scrolling through the application, um, little help bubbles will pop up uh, explaining exactly what we want from the questions. So things are as straightforward and uh, as possible. Um, you want to submit your grant application on time and don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm always available and always happy to answer your questions about your project and your application. So um, I mentioned that uh, there's a pre-application on our website. Uh, once everything checks out with that, I send you a link to the full application. That link will take you to a page that looks a lot like this. Um, this is the uh, sign-in page on our application portal. If you've never signed in to Smarter Select before, you're going to have to create a new account. The reason I mention this is because there are two tabs here. You can see on the right, it says sign in. And on the left, it says create new account. A lot of folks try to sign in right away, um, not having created a new account yet. Um, that was probably the only thing that we ran into in our last grant round that caused anyone any trouble. So I wanted to point out that it's really important for you to first create an account in Smarter Select uh, before you can proceed with your application. So I don't want anybody to be confused by this. So, uh, so I thought I would point that out. All right, so um, once you receive your link to the full application and you create an account and sign in, it will take you to a page that looks just like this. This describes the Preserve New York grant program. Uh, the application deadline is right there at the top of the screen, April 15th at 5 p.m. Um, there's a description of the program requirements. And then if you look down toward the bottom, there's a little blue link that says preview. If you click on that, you'll be able to preview your application before you start filling it out. And that's really nice because you can see what's going to be required. You can print it out if you want to and show it to your board of directors or whoever needs to see it. Um, and then when you're ready, you can hit the little green apply button and you can proceed with your application. Um, this online portal saves your work, so you can save your work as you go. It saves your uploads as well, so you can work on your application little by little over time until you get it done and ready to submit. Um, we premiered this online uh, portal for our grant applications last year with our technical assistance grants, and I have to say people found it easy to use. It saved uh, a lot of time and effort. There was no need to upload a bunch of attachments and email them to us. You upload them right in line in the application itself. Uh, it's really simple to use. I hope you all uh, find it easy to use as well. And of course, if you don't find it easy to use, I can always help answer any questions you have. All right. So uh, you might be wondering how we decide who gets the grant. So our uh, grant applications are evaluated by an independent panel of preservationists from across New York State. Sometimes they're uh, museum people, preservation consultants, uh, people who've worked in the field of preservation for years and know what to look for in these applications. We convene this uh, review panel and uh, they score each application on its own merits. So each application is looked at um, and scored um, based on three criteria. So those three criteria are historic preservation excellence and project quality, fiscal and managerial competence of the applicant, 
and service to the public. So we're looking for those three things in each application. Uh, each of those three criteria receive a score between zero and five, and then those scores are averaged to arrive at one score for each application. Those scores are put into a spreadsheet, they are ranked, and then we have a set amount of money that we have to give, and we go through that list of applications until we reach the end of that money and we draw a line. And we fund everything above the line and we do not fund what falls below the line. So it sounds simple. Um, it is kind of, we do discuss the applications uh, amongst ourselves. We um, talk about each and every one of them and uh, our reviewers you know, receive uh, feedback from the Preservation League based on what we know about uh, each project. So when you communicate with me about your project and ask questions, um, I will be better able to uh, clarify your project, your organization and your application for the review panel. Um, I don't have voting privileges. I don't get to decide who gets the grant and who doesn't, and I don't get to affect uh, what scores are given. But I do get to answer the questions of the review panel when they need further clarification about your application. So the more I know, the more I can help them decide and score your application. So these three criteria are listed in our grant guidelines. So if you want to make sure that your summary letter uh, shows how your application stands out uh, for each of these uh, criteria points, please check out the grant guidelines and you'll see exactly how to structure your summary letter to answer those. All right, so we don't have much time left. I'm gonna zoom through Fran's tips and tricks. You all know Fran, maybe you don't know Fran. She used to be the grants manager. She has moved on to the State Historic Preservation Office, but she had some specific things to keep in mind about your um, application. So some things you wanna make sure you do uh, read through the grant application itself as soon as you get that link uh, so that you can see what required documents you'll need to upload. You can put those together in a folder on your desktop and have them ready to go. Make your application process a lot simpler. Um, read through the grant program guidelines. I can't stress that enough. The guidelines will answer a lot of questions you might have about applying and how to structure your summary letter. And the grant application instructions are no longer given out as, as a standalone document. They pop right up in the application itself as you go through it. So they'll help you uh, construct the most thorough and appropriate answers to the application questions. We ask uh, for two budgets in your uh, Preserve New York application. One is your organizational budget. So that's for the current year, um, demonstrating income and expenses for your organization. Um, if you're a municipality and you're applying, please don't send us a 60 page budget. No, just send us a one page summary of income and expenses for that department within your munis municipality that's going to be in charge of overseeing this grant. Okay, so whether it's your parks department or if you have a museum department or something like that, um, whatever it is, we just wanna see the one page summary of income and expenses for that department overseeing the grant. So. It's important to keep that in mind. Make sure that your budget reflects where that 20% cash match is going to come from. We wanna make sure that you've got that on hand and ready to go uh, when we send you your grant check. The second budget we ask for is the project budget. Uh, I wanna clarify that the project budget is only the budget for um, this consultant project that we are funding. So that's, this does not include any capital expenses for restoration or rehabilitation work to follow. Um, you may have in the back of your head how much that might cost, but we don't need to know that at this point. So all you need to do is give us um, the clear breakdown of tasks, deliverables, and totals from your consultant. Um, your consultant will provide these fees um, and this breakdown for you in a project budget. So that's what we're looking for there. And make sure that you take plenty of pictures and submit 10 of them with your application. Um, you know, just keep in mind that we may not be familiar with your historic site or your museum or your building. So make sure that you're telling as much of the story as you can through those pictures. All right. 
at long last, here is my contact information. Um, some of you may have my email address. It's jrudler at preservenys.org, or you can email grants at preservenys.org. I get these emails, so they both come to me. Uh, you can also call me directly um, at 518-462-5658, extension 10, and um, always be happy to answer your questions. The Preserve New York deadline is Friday, April 15th at 4.59 p.m. So I hope to see plenty of applications come in from you all. If uh, you have any additional questions, please ask them now, or you can ask them later. You can always email me or give me a call if you have questions that occur to you later. This presentation is being recorded and will be made accessible on our YouTube site, um, on our YouTube page, sorry. And uh, I have another grant webinar coming up on February 9th at 5 p.m. So if you didn't get enough today, you can come back for that one uh, or you can tell all your friends to tune in on February 9th as it'll be just like today, except that I'll be uh, looking at three other examples of successful REDC grants. So some more inspiring stories to be told. Please keep in contact with the league this way. Um, if you liked today's presentation, please consider making a donation. We are a not-for-profit not for and we rely on your donations to do the work that we do across the state. So are there any final questions before I let you all go for the day? All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. It was a pleasure uh, to answer your questions today. And uh, I, I'll look for your grant application to come in. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. Bye-bye now. <laughs>